Hello, everyone. Welcome to the new edition of the IITT. This time, again, an interesting subject. It's like the fashion subject nowadays for TC218 on geosynthetics. And we have with us wonderful, renowned people. I'm going to introduce you to our speakers today. Let me share my screen. So, with us, uh, Dr. Oliver Dieter, the Head of Engineering and Business Development at Husker Synthetic. He's a part-time lecturer also at the and the Chair of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Ruhr University in Germany. With us, my neighbor, Dr. Jorge Zomberg from Austin, Texas, UT in Austin, one of the top universities in uh, the States and Texas, of course. He's a past president of the International Geosynthetic Society, IGS. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bravi uh, Daniel Ashka, who soon will be a doctor, wish you the best. He's a lecturer at Cape Coast Technical University in Ghana, lovely country. And uh, I'm gonna start by, I cannot wait to hear what you're gonna uh, tell us today. I'm gonna start with Dr. Oliver. Uh, Oliver, you're welcome. The floor is yours. You're welcome to share your screen. Perfect. And please so, let this be a friendly interactive talk. So if I interrupt you, don't be offended <laughs> or any No, no, that. please, please. It's a, it's a friendly- I'm happy for <laughs> Happy for any question. Yeah, um, great to be here today and thanks for the opportunity to um, introduce or to talk a bit about the TC 2018 reinforced field structures. Um, what is the committee doing? What are we, what are our aims and what have we done so far? So um, we are um, a committee which looks into the reinforced field structures which can be reinforced with geosynthetics but also with steel elements like steel strips and steel letters, so we are covering the whole aspect of reinforced field structures. And you are the um, vice chair of this technical committee. Correct. The, yeah, I'm the vice chair since uh, two or three years now, and it's a great team, which I will uh, like to introduce to you also uh, shortly. Right. Um, it all started uh, as a topic in the TC211, in the um, ground stabilization. And in 2017, John Sankey said, well, that's a quite interesting and important topic. So we should give it an own TC. So he had the idea to start with the own, own TC just for this reinforced field structures um, to better communicate about this technology and to better promote it also. So he was successful in managing that. And since 2017, we had then the TC 218. John was the first chair together with Jim and with Julia. And in 2020, then we took over, and Julia, myself, and Charia um, are currently heading this uh, great group of, of people in the TC 2018. And it's very, very, uh, yeah, I like it. It's very interactive also in the group. Everybody participates and contributes, and we keep on doing that. Very Early. active, very active subcommittees. So if I'm absolutely, I... mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, in total, we have 78 members, 44 official registered and 34 external. So you can say if you li like to join the, the MTC, um, you, you can look in, come into our meetings, our meetings. Partic participate. Um, from this 44 official members, 25 are nominated by the local societies. Before I talk more about the TC itself, just a short introduction, what are reinforced field structures? Um, you can see here a first picture. The reinforced field structures is a combination of granular material like soil with a reinforcing element. Normally the granular material can take a lot of load. It's good in bearing and in pressure, but it's not as good uh, um, in tension. And to create this, uh, a reinforcing element can be placed into the soil 
and then you have the pressure and the tension and you can create great structures like over steep slopes up to 90 degrees. I even will show you a picture with 110 degrees, so over steep slope. And it has a very, very good uh, yeah, load bearing behavior and has excellent performance also shown in yeah, very difficult situations like earthquake uh, loadings or in difficult terrains. And I will end the presentation or this, this my, my first introduction with a short case study on this one to show you also the versatility of this technology. Um, as reinforcement element, as said before, you can use geosynthetics either as a geogrid or also strips. Normally they are made out of polyester, polypropylene, polyvinyl alcohol or aramide. So you have different raw materials depending on the situation and the requirements. And you also have those steel strips which can be used either as a strip or as a ladder to reinforce the soil. From my uh, uh, practical uh, thoughts, I would say the strip is when you is attached to a hard facing of a wall, uh, whereas right. the other one can be used as a wrap, right? Or, uh... Exactly. So the strips, um, if you do it with the strips, you, you need some kind of hard facing like blocks or like a concrete element, like a panel. Like a panel. And, and with this full coverage element, I call it the geogrid, you can do a wrap around and then you can have even, let's call it a naked facing, just with the, with the geogrid itself. Um, a few examples, I don't want to spoil the other um, contributions, so just four short examples. You can build very high retaining structures, heights over 30 meter has been done several times. You can use them as a load carrying bridge abutments with very high loads. And Jorge, I don't spoil your presentation, so I stay short on this one. Um, you can have them as an earth pressure relief, which is a quite interesting application. And we see here a building on the right side of the picture with a height of 50 meter, which was totally covered with soil. And to reduce the earth pressure from this 50 meter of soil, a retaining structure has been constructed just 50 centimeter behind the wall, leaving a gap. So no earth pressure was transmitted to the wall, which made then the wall design itself, the concrete wall design, very economic. And that's due to the very good deformation behavior. Um, if you talk about Rawson, I somehow have a echo in my speaker, but where, where is this picture from? This is from the Netherlands. Yep. The project from okay. the Netherlands. Excellent. Let's, and, uh, yeah. we, will, we will mute our uh, mics when you're talking and then it's better to be muted. Perfect. So um, yeah, just as an indication, if you uh, think about horizontal deformation. If the wall is good constructed, you will have less than 1% horizontal deform deformation in com uh, comparison or in relation to the wall height. And as promised here, 110 degrees with the reinforced fill structure, again, in the application as an earth pressure relief, um, with some tricks, you can do it even 110% at uh, 10, 10 degrees. And then again, leaving a gap between the soil and this very slender element here from this um, bridge itself made it possible to have the approach here. Okay, so you can do a lot of different things and which is also very important uh, if you do construct something, you are at a certain budget and you can see with, with those methods, with this technology, you are very cost efficient. Um, uh, you see here the graph where you have this gravity wall, cantilever wall or reinforced fill structures in comparison. What is the cost per running meter length of the wall in relation to the wall height? And you can see that those reinforced fill structures are um, on the lower end. So they are more economically, they are cheaper than the, let's call them uh, conventional retaining structures. But not only the cost is beneficial, also the, um, um, the impact on the, on the nature. So you have a, a strongly reduced CO2 emission. So the global, global warming potential, it's produced by far compared to anything which has to do with, with concrete or cement. Um, the same is for the uh, energy demand in the production of the material, but also in the construction of the wall itself. So there are many, many different um, life cycle assessments on different projects available, showing the, this huge potential, this huge benefit of those structures. And you also, 
can request EPDs that are environmental product declarations from the products where you see all the, the um, specific values on um, CO2 emission, how much do you need for this product and where does it come from? So it's, yeah, the, the um, economical and ecological aspects are very focused on by this technology. Oliver, uh, if you go back one, uh, yes. Just to tell the audience, if you look at the first graph, from what I understand, classical civil engineering, we like the concrete cantilever wall. And this is the line in the circles. So from yes. this graph, you can tell, you can say that when the height start becoming higher than five meters, you should really consider um, the reinforced fill structure or uh, MSE wall or using geosynthetics because it's cheaper. How about time? Is it faster or depends if... Yeah. That's, that's, uh, it always depends. <laughs> But no, it, it's uh, it's a uh, let's put it that way. It's uh, um you should should even consider it if you start with three meter high walls. Um, depending on the site you are at, um, it can have different uh, uh, advantages. The one is that you are very um fast. The construct construction is very fast. You don't have to do any kind of um, how you call it, scaffolding for the concrete, for example. You just construct the wall. And the second one is that you have very easy equipment. You just need a thing to compact. You need a truck to transport the soil and you need a two or three workers to place the material. And that makes it quite fast also. And if yeah, I just may to... add yeah. performance, yes. if performance. I may add, it's, it's not only cost, but it's also performance. And typically when you have some level of flexibility that plays a significant role in aspects such as differential settlements, toler tolerance to differential settlements, or ability to perform better under seismic conditions. And I think that they, I think that the the graph that Oliver is showing in in the second graph, the sustainability, and the third one, which is also related to that, is going to play a more and more significant role in the selection of alternatives. Yeah. One uh, just... quick parenthesis. This is so exciting. Sorry, Oliver. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so at a recent project I was looking at, we found that if you incline a little bit the wall and you avoid using hard face, it's much cheaper, much, much cheaper than um, concrete. So not only the height, but but also the inclination, if you have room to incline it a little bit, then definitely we should go with the geosynthetics. Yeah. If you yeah, have you're room. very you're very flexible with the inclination, with the looking the appearance of the facing, with, with the shape of the wall. It's and very easy compared to other technologies. So yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so what are the activities we're doing? We have in the TC218 a quarterly video conference call. We always adapt the time so we can cover all zoo, uh, time zones in the world. Um, it's a very, I would say, a very interactive meeting we have there always. Always like 40, 50, uh, 40 people, around 40 people are joining us. Um, we are addressing the different matters concerning our committee. We are informing about the activities on the subcommittee status. So I will later on show you what are the subcommittees are active on or what has been done already and what's available. Um, we are talking about conferences, related activities, what are we are going to plan there. Um, as you see later, we are organizing also parallel sessions on different conferences. We give updates on publications. And it's also, with I find maybe even one of the most important points, it's an open forum for, on the topics of interest from the membership. So everybody, everybody can... Uh, share his knowledge, can request information, can talk about whatever he wants in relation to the reinforced field structures. And that makes it very valuable for everybody to learn from other people. And that's um, uh, yeah, one good activity we have there. Um, you can access or you can find us in the internet for sure. Um, we have the web page on the um, ISS MGE page where you can find news and announcements. And we are also in the geo world um, where we have a lot of documents produced which can be downloaded 
um, they are linked also with the ISM GE um, page. There we already have nearly 500 followers, which is quite nice. I hope after this uh, ITTT, we have much more followers on every page here. So we are also busy on LinkedIn, on LinkedIn. where we um, yeah, report on recent activities and infos. And please join us please and join have us. a look there. It's very interesting. Here, as uh, president of ISSMG, for our uh, viewers, if you do not have an account with GeoWorld, please open one. It's a really nice um, uh, way to interact as geotechnical engineers. It's our Facebook, like it's the Facebook of the profession. Believe me, I discovered that my neighbor is a geotechnical engineer using the interactive map on GeoWorld um, and LinkedIn, of course, and our website, of, so, of course. But GeoWorld, I had to mention this. Uh, thank you, Oliver, for having it here. Keep going. Sorry to interrupt. That's, that's good. Do it. Do it. Uh, okay. Activities in the past, we have been on different conferences uh, with uh, sessions which we organized or we took part, like Korea 2017, a workshop in Munich 2018, in Reykjavik 2019. Uh, we joined the TCR from the IGS um, from the uh, on, on, yeah. On reinforced soil structures in Barcelona. We organized two parallel sessions lately, uh, 2022 in Sydney, and also have some activities in Case History Journal where we try to yeah, also promote the topic. Um, we produced also a time capsule project, which is on the webpage of ISMGE. Please have a look on it. It's a very nice video, all uh, different participants of our TC could participate and contribute. Um, we had the topic past, present, future, uh, hist uh, the past history of reinforced fill structures, important milestones, why did it became famous, why does it make sense to use it, and then the state of the art, where are we currently, what are the developments, and also the challenges. And then I think, Jorge, you just mentioned that environmental impacts is a big, huge challenge, and that's something we can attack, or we can or not attack, we can tackle with this technology. Um, then the future developments, what are is the upcoming goals? What are the global needs and upcoming challenges? It's a very nice and short video, so please have a look on it. Um, yeah, and lately we did our first webinar, which was a big success in our opinion. Um, we had over 200 people registered for the webinar. Professor Raja Gopal from India reported on experience from India with reinforced soil structures. And in the end, we had over 130 participants and that's, yeah, something which was really very good and uh, also some nice discussions there. This webinar is recorded and we will um, also publish this uh, soon. The subcommittees are also quite active. We have um, some ac active topics and some are already closed. So we um, decide with the group what kind of topic is interesting, what should we work on, and then we have a team leader or subcommittees leader from the participants of the TC um, we had talked about terminology, about codes interpretation, construction, best practice. Those are already closed, and you will find the conclusion out of those activities. To, um, for example, on the geo world, there are all, always reports you can go through and read. Um, currently active are the subcommittee on reinforced fill structure as bridge abutment, and also the use of marginal fill. Um, you know that not always you will have good sand or gravel and you should also try to um, to work with uh, marginal fill to be more economical and, and ecological that can be done with this technology but then you have to have some certain things in your mind and to be careful um, to do the right thing we also had an email exchange uh, uh, twice which was um, on the topic of serviceability limit state analysis of reinforced soil walls and reinforced field structures performance and railroad applications. Um, that works this way, that there was the main topic. And then um, we had the email chain. Everybody could answer whenever he thought some good, um, that can give some good input or he could ask a question. And then you always add on the last email you got. And whenever you had the time and and uh, and something to say, you could add, could add on. That was also very successful. It was hard to summarize afterwards, but also that was managed. And also this uh, are documented and can be seen on the GeoWorld page. What else? Yeah, 
that's what I would wanted to say to the TC. Um, that's what we are doing, and we are hoping for much more members. Please join us. It's a very great group of people and a great um, exchange. Um, if somebody, Hawk, if you would like something here, otherwise I would talk about a short case study to give you some um, input on the, or some insight. Yeah, let's, let's move on with the case study. Unless uh, uh, Bravi or Joe Jorge wants to say something. Now, very active subcommittees. So in addition to the meetings of the actual committee, there are meetings of the actual, of the subcommittees. Um, that's a very regular. Role model for the other active. TC. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then I give you a short case study, and it's just a very interesting, pro in my opinion, a very imp impressive and interesting project in Austria, and that was the new construction of the road B114, which connected Trieben with Judenburg in Austria and the Alps, and we are looking on the section close to Trieben, and this section, um, so it's a very important uh, connection between between those seats, but um, there were some big issues with the road section close to Trieben. As you can see here, the retaining structures um, made out of concrete, they sheared, and also there have been some bridges which have been back anchored into the into the slopes, into the um, into the slopes. And what you see in these red circles are the the head of the anchor. And if you see them, that's not good because then the anchor has ruptured. Why did that happen? Because the road was on a on a creepy slope, on a you say creepy slope, so you have a steady movement downward, maybe one millimeter, one centimeter per year, and by this constant movement, you had um, yeah, it's, huge it's plastic deformation with time, like a glacier, very slow. It's it's pretty yeah. common on a high slope. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and that lead to, to major major um, damages on the retaining structures and on the bridge, so it was not safe anymore. Um, they kept on repairing and maintaining and maintenance uh, to do maintenance on this road. So at some sections, you ended up with two meters of asphalt. So for the asphalt industry, I think it was a great, <laughs> great road. But uh, yeah, you, you can see that it was a lot of, of work to be done just to keep it going. And there was no the um, danger of a, uh, let's say, increase in speed of this movement. And so um, a major collapse could had happen. So um, what they started is that they monitored the whole road by GPS. So in case they see that something is um, getting worse, they could block the, the road at any time. Um, but they also had to think about an alternative. What can we do? Um, you see it. Those pictures showing the yeah the, the landscape there. It's a really steep terrain. You have always the uh, yeah the danger of an avalanche or landslide, and also creep prone slopes everywhere. So um, what they finally have done was to construct a new road, a complete new road, on the opposite side, on the other side of the uh, of the valley, which is here shown in the upper picture. It's it's a red line, and you can see below the the um, yeah. Can you see my cursor? So this was is the, the old road, which was then still under traffic. And this was the new road constructed here. Um, so they constructed on the opposite hillside a new road. And also there you had a creep issue, but not always, not, not, not everywhere. Um, and before the old road had a quite high inclination or steepness. And they um, wanted to reduce this by seven times. And the strategy was to go straight through those creep areas, which are called here Tal Zuschub Nord and Süd. So a short German lecture that are the creep areas. They go through here quite quickly. And then they had the serpentine in a more stable area. And then they went again straight through the creep area. So um, by constructing the road on the other side, they could yeah, start from new from the scratch. And they could also keep the traffic running on the old road, there's a possibility to close it if it's necessary. So the solution here was reinforced fill because of different aspects. Um, before they have seen that due to this permanent movement, you had cracks in this concrete elements because they cannot bear a lot of differential settlement, a lot of differential deformation. And that's something beneficial with this technology. They can compensate deformation to a certain extent without having a big damage. 
they are easy to construct because you will see pictures from the construction. It's a very difficult terrain. And so this technology was chosen here and the highest wall in this project was up to 28 meter. So um, as you have seen before, the roads are very close. You do not cannot allow, allow for a lot of traffic um, in, in this um, area. So the reinforcement material was cut in a base camp to lengths, then it was folded, and then it was easy to be transported. You do not have to transport big rolls up there. And um, uh, for the setup, for the construction, bended steel mesh was used as a temporary support during the construction to be able to compact the soil also in the front very good. So you had a um, temporary um, uh, formwork here. You see a bit of green inside and, and black, the black thing that are the geogrids and the green thing is the erosion potential. So you want to avoid any loose of material through the front, through the openings of the grid. So a finer mesh was placed there. And then you can see here the, um, the materials delivered. That is local material. You had um, some cut areas where you had to cut off the, the material. The material which was um, gained there was then broken down to a certain size and then it was used in another place. So it was a very um, yeah, use, sensible use of the material was taken off the mountainside from another location. And with this um, technology, then the walls have been constructed up to 20 meter, 28 meter on the left picture, for example. And there was also some additional measures. So you can see it on the right picture in the upper edge. Uh, drainage um, going through the wall. This drainage went far into the hillside, into the slope. And the idea is to take the water out of the slope to reduce the creep. And that was also a very successful um, idea. And on the lower left picture, you see one of the most critical uh, locations in the project, a very steep um, area below the wall and a very steep area uh, above the wall. And not with all, so with, with this very simple technology, because you do not need a lot of heavy machinery, it was, you have been able, or it was possible here to construct easily a 20 meter high wall to compensate for the, um, or to be the base for the road later on in this very difficult situation. Yeah, pictures of the finished road, the serpentines, you can see how nicely they fit into the landscape. And here a full picture of the full road. It's a very successful project. It's uh, no, this is the stable zone. Mode. This is a stable zone, exactly. Here is a stable zone, and here is one creep area, and here the other creep area starts. But by right. the drainage, really, um, even here and here, there was nearly no movement anymore. So, all what I ask you about ideas... uh, the horizontal dewatering or drainage was it installed by horizontal drilling? Um, I would say yes. I'm not very. I'm not sure about that. But they had to. Yeah, they had to go into the hillside. I, I guess they drilled it in. It was and like was twenty thirty just meters. Just curiosity. Just out of curiosity, because I had to solve one time a problem like this. So I the question check. is how deep to go, etc. Hmm. No. Keep going. Yeah, Thank and you. I think that was a very successful project and shown also the um, big advantage of this technology. And that would be my contribution. This I will contribute later on, but that's all my presentation. Wonderful. Excellent. Now uh, we give the floor to King George. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. I'm gonna start. Uh, let me share my screen and uh, make sure that you're seeing my screen now. Can you can you see my screen? Shared screen. All right. So let me get rid this of this. There you go. Okay, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to share some thoughts in this very interesting modality uh, of the put together by the ISSMGE. The topic that I'm gonna be discussing is a subset of the many different alternatives that uh, the use of uh, 
reinforcements, field reinforcements can bring to the table to the portfolio of geotechnical engineers. And it has an interesting name, and I'm going to tell you what that is. And that is load carrying geosynthetic bridge abutments. Load carrying geosynthetic reinforced bridge abutments. And I'm going to tell you what that, those are. By the way, this is one of the topics of our subcommittee. And But I'm going to focus on two things. One is why are we going to choose this alternative to begin with? And second, a big question that we always have is, uh, you're going to see that we're dealing with concentrated lo loads. So the question is, will they last or will they creep as the, in, the, in the problem that we have seen very recently in, in our previous case history? But before we get into what is a load carrying just synthetic reinforced bridge abutment, let me ask you a question. Um, what is this? And here we have three experts. And so what is this? The head of a dinosaur. <laughs> nope. It's not the head of a dinosaur. Dr. Dieter? It's like that. Well, it's it's a nice picture. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, maybe it's a very old uh, reinforced earth. There's this, there's this like grass or wooden sticks because I see some tiny things. Very there. good, very good. That's in the right track. So, um, Robbie, any any suggestion? Yes, uh, I remember um, in the village, mostly you have mud houses. Uh -huh. And in, this, in these mud houses are uh, sticks and uh, timber in there together with the mud. Okay. So this, this picture looks uh, similar to, to that. Very good. Very good. So we are in the right track. Congratulations. Because this is indeed, a, so these are some relics from the Great Wall of China, which is what we can call a reinforced soil structure. Uh, at the time there was no metal and there was no geosynthetics, but there were reeds and there were uh, opportunities to reinforce uh, uh, soil. Uh, it may, most of us may be familiar with the Great Wall of China from the Ming Dynasty, and this is near Beijing, but that's only four, only 400 years old. We are now talking about the Han Dynasty in the northwest of China. And we're talking about over 2,200 years old relics. And they have lasted the passage of time because of the technology that we may have known 2,000 years ago. And we had to rediscover it. Fast forward 2,000 years until the 1960s, we rediscovered reinforced soil wall, but the technology is proving how long it can last. Um, Jorge, then, what was the now, material and the layers? What was the material they used? Uh, straw? I mean, straw, yeah, reeds and straw, yeah. Mm -hmm. And wow. now that that we are talking, since we are talking about will these structures last? Let me go very specifically to one type of structure. So Oliver has given many good examples of reinforced soil structures. And here we have a very typical, we use many of these in breach abutments. Uh, and this is, for example, what we could call a, and I'm gonna be focusing, even though we can use steel, because it's my specialty, I'm gonna focus on geosynthetic as reinforcement. And this is what we could call a geosynthetic reinforced breach abutment, which is essentially, we have the, the approaching road into an, into an overpass, for example, and the entire retaining structure is held together and stabilized using geosynthetic reinforcements, like the very interesting case history that Oliver mentioned. However, very often and most commonly, the load of the uh, girders, the load of the bridge, is transferred directly to bedrock through deep foundations. And that's why we have the very infamous 
bump at the end of the bridge because we're coming, the, 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 the wall is sitting on the ground surface and it may settle more than the, even though there's a significant load, the load of the bridge is very often a, a founded on the foundations in the very rigid substrate. So this is a geosynthetic reinforced wall in a bridge abutment. And just for you to notice the difference, this is instead a load carrying geosynthetic reinforced breach abutment. In this case, we're gonna ask more from the geosynthetic reinforced soil structure. We're gonna ask them to be a retaining wall because they still we still need to contain laterally the access roads, but we're also gonna ask the structure to be a reinforced foundation because we're gonna ask the structure to tolerate and to support the the, the, the significant loads of the bridge itself. So this is the type of structure that we are going to be discussing in this presentation. And I'm going to ask, and I'm, I have collected six case histories. And the reason why I chose this his, case history, but don't be scared, I'm planning to go this very quickly. Uh, so uh, I have selected six case histories to force, I'm going to go around the world, except I'm going to leave Africa for Bravi so, um, um, to, to cover this uh, later on, not necessarily in this technology, but in general technologies in Africa. But I'm going to focus on two things. One, why? Why have, could we as an engineer choose these load carrying LC geosynthetic reinforced GR breach abutments over other more conventional technologies? And second, how long do they last? Because the potential concern could be, well, first, I don't wanna be the first one, I'm in transportation agency, I don't wanna be the first one doing this uh, during a uh, potentially beneficial, but a uh, structure, and I wanna show you that this has been done uh, very successfully. And second, that these structures, even though the loads are concentrated, they are not going to be prone to deformations or time-dependent deformations, which may have been another concern. So in order to illustrate these two very important uh, aspects, I'm going to walk you through six case histories. And I'm first going to take you to Japan. Uh, more specifically, I'm going to take you to the city of Nagoya. And the, so more specifically, I'm gonna go to the Tokahiro rail line at Hibitsu. This is the place where we Japanese uh, engineering started with the concept of the bullet train, but we're talking about the 1990s. So the structure that I'm gonna show you is uh, over 30 years ago, and we are gonna see how well it is performing. So this is a view, this is a reasonably different concept. It's still reinforced structure, but different than what Oliver was showing. And in the, in the case that the Japanese engineers rely heavily, in addition to rely on the reinforcement itself, they rely heavily on the rigidity of the facing. But what, what you will notice in this case that it, even though it was very pioneering, probably the first of its kind, uh, the load of the structure rested directly on the retaining walls, not on deep foundations. And this is a view of the uh, structure right after construction, courtesy of Professor Fumio Tatsuoka. Uh, this is the one structure in 1992. And I have been on a crusade to collect from this old structures, uh, recent inspections. And I'm very proud to tell you that this 1992 over 30 years old structure has been revisited as early as less than a month ago uh, by personnel by the Central Japan Railway Company. And here you have before and after, and I cannot see the difference. And they have reported no significant distress. This is the, the main motivation for choosing this type of structure. I say that I will tell you why they chose it. I'll tell you why. The reason that they chose it is because being the, 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 a bullet train, it needs to satisfy very stringent tolerance requirements in terms of potential 
deflections. The, perf the tolerances were extremely tight. They were met with this new technology at the time, but it's over 30 years old now. So what is the significance of this Nagoya load carrying just entering reinforced bridge abutment? Well, it's a successfully addressed the tight deflection requirements imposed by this a very new technology at the time. It is probably corresponds to the oldest bridge that used this technology that right now is becoming more and more common and more popular for very good reasons. And its long performance has been outstanding. We're talking about an over 30 years old structure that has not shown, we're not talking about stability only, we're talking about deflections. All right, so let's go somewhere else. In this case, I'm going to take you to Barney's Point, a load carrying geosynthetic reinforced bridge abutment in beautiful Australia. Uh, and why, where is in the Pacific Highway along the Australian coastline? Uh, in New South Wales, at the intersection of the Pacific Highway with the Tweed River. Why was this chosen? Well, they had a, they, they have compressible soils, as in many cases we may have, and there are concerns with the uniformity of the settlements that we may have in an important superstructure like this. And the idea, the problem are not settlements. The problem are, does this lead to differential settlements? So this was taken as an alternative to minimize or hopefully eliminate the problems associated with differential settlements. All the structures that I've been selecting are old. In this case, it's not 30 years old, but it's over 25 years old. And uh, this is a view of the cross section of the structure. Again, it involves transferring the load, but now we're talking about a multi-span very significant breach, and we have a retained soil immediately behind the 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 base of the about of the abutments, and these are the different terraces of the reinforced soil system. Okay, so this is how the structure looked like during soon after its construction. In we are talking about in this case 1993. This is a picture from 1993, and we the, again the main fo the important focus and I'm focusing on why the previous one was tight tolerances on lateral deflections. Now we're talking about we're, uh, uniform talking, uh, settlements. That was the reason. 12 meter high? Uh, it is, uh, I need to get back because I don't have it, but it's, I it's think that it's over slide. that. Mm -hmm. On the previous slide, here it is. Uh, one, one more. One more. That's pretty impressive, yeah. So, but let me tell you more. This was built in 1993 and here you have a picture. And here is a view of how this looks uh, two days ago for by my good friends, uh, Preston Kendall and Warren Hornsey. And here you see the beautiful bridge abutment, not only impressive, big and beautiful. And this is drone technology that didn't exist in 1993, but we see it today uh, on how this impressive structure looked in July, 2023. And I remind the audience that today is July 8th. So this, there are very few days before, uh, since July started, this is two days ago. And this is how this impressive structure looks today, inspected in July, 2023, performing as if it were with settlements. And again, the problems are not the settlements, the problems are the uniformity of the settlements. In this case, a extremely well performance. So what is the significance of this load carrying are a bridge structure at Barney's Point in Australia. Well, one of the first major bridges, multi-span, significant loads supported by this system. Monitoring results in this, I'm not gonna get in several of these structures have been monitored uh, because they were considered pioneers and the monitoring results show very consistent performance in relation to what the designers anticipated. And there are no signs of distress and the settlements have been uniform as expected based on the selection of this technology. 
All right, so two reasons. One, uh, we do not want lateral deflections. We want uniform settlements. Let me take you to the Founders Meadows. Uh, now is, this is gonna be in uh, the United States in near Denver, Colorado. This is south of Denver. This is Castle Rock. And why do we want this? Now we're gonna be talking about differential settlements. So you remember that we had in a typical, most common breach, we have the load of the girders supported in deep foundations, the load of the road supporting on the ground surface, and the very infamous bump at the end of the breach, which you would be surprised how significant the costs and the hazards uh, safety hazards are if we do not take care of this. And when was this? Over 25 years old, uh, in constructed in 1998. This is a picture that we took. Um, um, uh, this is a picture that shows the two very impressive uh, load carrying geosynthetic reinforced bridge abutments, east abutment, West abutment, two spans. Again, the reason by the Colorado Department of Transportation was we do not want deep foundations. We want to minimize the bump at the end of the bridge, and this technology can help us, and it did. Uh, this is actually the picture that I showed you before. It's coming from this structure, and it was constructed in 1998. Extremely expeditious construction. Mm -hmm. It was constructed in stages without shutting down the road, completed in one year, decreased the construction cost because it avoided the use of deep foundations, and accommodated a very significant six lanes in this particular structure. I'm not going to go was into the, the bridge, details. Uh, continuous or, or too simply supported? Span. Two simply supported ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two simply supported spans. Yeah, uh, I'm, but I'm going to focus on the <laughs> movements. And after one year, give or take, here we have lateral lateral straining of the geosynthetics uh, versus time after opening the bridge to traffic. And after give or take one year, no time dependent movements have been monitored in this structure. And the very infamous bump at the end of the bridge, what you see here are a elevation surveys across the joint between the, the, the portion of the structure supported that supports the load and the, the girders and the approaching road, no differential settlements between these two structures. This is a little bit of cheating, but I promise you that we will get an live inspection in this bridge. We did visit this bridge uh, three years ago, but I want to visit in 2023. But this is a visit by Google Earth that today will let us see uh, the view, how this structure looks today, actually a few days ago. And here is a structure looking like it was 25 plus years ago. Uh, the structure looks inspected by Google Earth. Uh, but essentially looking extremely uh, well. And we inspected it in, in, and essentially there's no signs of bump at the end of the bridge. So why it was choose, this is one, actually this is the first project in the US that used this technology in a major highway. There have been other structures that used it in smaller highways. Uh, monitoring results have shown an outstanding performance in terms of the objectives on the selection of this structure. And there are no signs and consequently an excellent long-term performance. And we're talking about 25 plus years uh, without signs, we're not talking about distress, we're not talking about stability, we're talking about settlements, avoiding these very difficult to control bump at the end of the bridge. Let's go next. Ilsenburg, a load carrying geosynthetic reinforced bridge abutment. And uh, what is the reason uh, that we wanted to choose this uh, system. Well, we talked about lateral deflections. We talked about uniformity of settlements. We talked about bump at the end of the bridge. Let's talk about cost. Let's talk about water crossing structure. Why was this structure selected? Well, out of various alternatives, which included the most classic one, which was the use of deep foundations, uh, even though this structure was built over 20 years ago, 
uh, it was selected because it was the most cost effective. One of the important criteria, not the only, but one of the very important criteria that the engineers uh, are gonna go. Uh, and here's a view of these uh, structures soon after construction in year 2000. This structure has been also monitored. I'm not gonna get into the monitoring data, but this is a view of the cross section of the system. And so what are the, what is the significance? And we're in the process of inspecting all these old structures and uh, com confirm uh, the good performance <clears throat> by a formal inspection. And uh, the project successfully demonstrated how cost effective, not only good performance, but also how cost effective these systems can be. Uh, the monitoring records have shown consistent, significant consistency, good with the design assumptions. And it constitutes uh, one of the oldest, in addition to being not only a structure, typically we're dealing with water crossing systems and water crossing uh, structures have their own challenges. So this is one of the oldest water crossing uh, systems that have used this technology and has performed extremely successfully. Next, let's go to San Francisco, but not in California, but still in the West Coast of the Americas. Let's go to Chile. Uh, we are talking about the San Francisco load carrying just in 30 reinforced bridge abutment. Um, uh, overpassing the area that is the O'Higgins region in Chile, south of Santiago. The reason that this structure was chosen was we do not want changes in rigidity because we're in a highly seismic area. Uh, we want a, some, a, a structure that will provide the flexibility. When was it constructed? 2001, over 20 years ago. This is a view of the cross section in this structure. <laughs> uh, this is a view of the structure during construction. Uh, here it is again, due right after construction. And here is, is, is a for a crossing on a railway system constructed soon after construction in 2001. Problem, a potential problem, 2010, nine years after construction, this was hit by a mega earthquake, maximum intensity of 8.8 mm, in, the, in, the in the maximum intensity scale, peak acceleration of 65% of the acceleration of gravity, significant victims, number of victims in Chile inspection of the bridge right after the earthquake, no significant signs of distress. I'm gonna ask you to pay attention to these vertical bars, which happen to be um, for seismic reasons in order to avoid the bumping, the vertical, the impact of the vertical component of the acceleration in the case of an earthquake. And notice how vertically a, a log, a, how vertical these initially vertical bars uh, have remained after the structure. But here we have a problem. But let me tell you, it's another bridge, concrete structure around the same location in the same orientation, subjected to very similar accelerations with significant problems. This is not the San Francisco bridge that was built using this technology, but another bridge, concrete bridge, used more conventional technology, located essentially six kilometers apart uh, from the San Francisco bridge that I have just shown you, similar orientation, similar material, same year of construction, uh, but a very significant difference in performance. And again, this was a, an earthquake with very catastrophic um, uh, outcomes. Uh, but here, this is to me a very significant evidence of the performance. These are the vertical bars in the San Francisco breach abutment, vertical before the earthquake, remain vertical after the earthquake. And this is in the cousin, also the same year, born the same year well, with the same material concrete, but one being a load carrying just in theory reinforced breach abutment, the other being a concrete structure, more rigid structure, significant problems in its performance. And not only that, but let's revisit it. And this is a inspection done in last, uh, Actually, it was June 2023. I need to correct this, but it's a month ago. 
And here we have the view of the structure as it looked over 20 years ago, going through a major earthquake and is still performing excellently. So what are the, the nice significance graph. of this? Mm -hmm. What the is nice the significance graphic. of this structure? Yeah, with nice graffiti. Yeah, and now we see that it's not only designed successfully against an earthquake, but tested against seismic stability um, uh, with a significant magnitude earthquake. And recent inspection has demonstrated a continuously excellent long-term performance. Let's continue going around the world, but this time let's go to uh, Brazil. And I'm going to take you the Maringa load carrying geosynthetic reinforced breach abutment. Uh, this is a challenging structure from the constructability point of view because it involved fine grained saws that very often are stay away from fine grained saws. This is a reinforced saw structure. Well, this for constructability reasons, for logistics on the construction, this was a very important aspect in the, in the structure. Um, to address the complex constructability issues. It was constructed over 15 years ago in 2007. This is a view of the cross section. This involved a lowering an ex significant excavation for a railway system. It, this is a view, a very quick view on the system, on how it was. Essentially, it was the widening of a, think of it as a big trench that it required construction without interrupting the use of a railway system. It's such a big structure that is potentially hard even to take a picture to recognize the significance of it, but it's a significant big trench that is crossed by four or five of these load carrying geosynthetic reinforced breach abutments, but in which the, the fill material was the same material that was being excavated, a clay, a laterite, laterized clay. Uh, so what is the significance of this a load carrying geosynthetic reinforced spirit uh, structure. It managed to use uh, the very famous red clays in tropical Brazil. Uh, it used load carrying geosynthetic reinforced, uh, uh, load carrying geosynthetic reinforced uh, technology to avoid interruption of the railway line that remained active throughout the entire construction period and a major, very seen, very long uh, project and has shown adequate long-term performance since its initial construction. So in conclusion, I've walked you through six case histories that tells us a lot about two things. One is very good reasons on why to choose this system first, and I walk you through examples of six exam six cases in six corners of the world with six different reasons. Reason number one, the need to maintain tight lateral deflections. Reason number two, to avoid uh, the problems associated with compressible soils. Reason number three, the need of avoiding or minimizing or eliminating the bump at the end of the bridge. Reason number four, we always want to be cost effective. Reason number five, we are struggling with seismic stability. And reason number six, uh, we, when we have significant cons uh, constructability constraints, even when needing to use a, a fine grained soils, this has proven to be an excellent technology. And above all, all these structures are somewhere between 15 and 30 years old, recently inspected, and they have all continued to perform, shown an outstanding long-term performance. So after walking you through these uh, different structures around the world with uh, be selected because of different reasons, all performing well, all old structures, early examples of this technology. Thank you for the opportunity to share of sharing this. Thank you, Jorge. This is really, really excellent. Thank you so much. Um, just uh, to be, you know, you gave conclusions, very nice conclusions, but I like to ask you if there are warnings or disadvantages, mainly for the young engineers watching this. As an example, uh, if you have 
an abutment on soft material, um, I would be very careful using this technology, especially if the bridge has been designed by the structural engineers as a continuous pre-stress bridge. Then uh, allowing the abutment to go down uh, may lead to not so good results. So we have to well, be careful. Not always the best solution. And uh, Absolutely. It, it, each case is going to be its own case. It has been used in multi-span yeah, bridges. Yeah. Um, if it is, uh, the case that you're saying is particularly how to evaluate multi-span systems in which the but the, for example, the central piers may be designed with different settlements. Um, but again, the, the every case is going to be a case. In the cases that I showed you, even in cases, for example, a, an area or a corner of the world that I didn't show you examples is the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, the reason why this is chosen is as a way to avoid the problems uh, that they always have regarding settlements. So we need to know how to design them. We need to do predictions. Uh, but if we know how to address the settlements, uniformity of the settlements typically are more important, not always, but typically are more important than the total magnitude of the settlement. So how to handle the magnitude, the settlements are gonna occur. But in some cases, in many cases, the main enemy are particularly depending on our design are the differential settlements. So this is a good way not to avoid total settlements, but to avoid differential settlements. Good examples are some of the examples that I showed. And I didn't show examples from the Netherlands, but in that, that area, they are using this system very significantly on soft soils. So it can be used if we know what we're doing. So to the young engineers, don't be afraid of new technologies. That's my, this is not so new because I showed exactly, you all structures yeah, between 15 be and 30 years, but newer than the very conventional structures. And uh, don't be afraid of new technologies. Uh, we are engineers and we need to confront uh, new challenges. And, and this is one option. It's not always the, the the solution to be uh, adopted, but one that I would say to always be considered, not necessarily the adopted one, but considered. Andrew, Maybe one, one say thank something. You. Yeah. Yeah, just, just one comment on, on that one. It's um, if you think about changing a concrete bridge abutment uh, with a retaining structure, you always have to keep in mind your bridge will become a bit longer. Because if you have a con concrete abutment, you can go right to the to the edge of the concrete structure. With, re um, with the soil retaining structure, you are mainly one meter. I saw 1.5 meter behind. So that's something you just have to keep in mind because we, we had the issue that sometimes if people came, wow, that's fantastic, make, make it a reinforced soil structure. Then we said, yeah, we will do. But please keep in mind, your bridge will become longer. And that's something which makes the design process a bit difficult. Very good sometimes. point. Let's see what they have Thank in you, Africa. Oliver. Bobby, are you ready? Yes, Focus. let me stop sharing. Yes. Unmute You're muted. yourself, Robin. Okay. You're muted, yeah. Thank you, you Chef, go. for this great initiative. Uh, Geosynthetics in Africa is picking ground. Uh, it has not been easy, but uh, with time, it is getting better. You do not have it in full um, screen mode. Okay. So. There you go. Okay. So... 
it's getting it's getting better now. We are having some projects in Africa in which geosynthetics is being applied, and I think with time we will we will catch up. Okay, so my presentation or my work is going to be a bit easier because uh Dr. Oliver and Dr. George has done quite uh, some of my slides, so it will make my work a bit easier. So with um, the background of reinforced earth, that is the ancient days where uh, cement and these things were not available, earth and then other materials were used. Uh, together with uh, bamboos, uh, timber, leaves, and other things to uh, build houses. And some of these houses have been in, uh, in use for many years. I remember very well in the village over 25 years now, if I go to the village, some of the structures are still there. So over at that time, I didn't understand what the principle behind it, the idea behind it, but our parents were using it. So it was when I came to this understanding that I realized that, okay, this is the reason or this was the principle behind these kind of things. So I think uh, bringing it into the soil system is, is, is a great initiative. We need to come back 2000 years from now and see that they're still performing. <laughs> I can tell you okay, so that uh, when I was young and I was uh, hunting, there were houses that has uh, ceilings made out of clay and straw. And their people were still living more than 300 years old houses with yeah. stone walls and clay, reinforced clay. Uh, uh, ceilings and all they do is water it and compress it with the roller you know these old uh, um, I, I saw this with my own eyes and I was always wondering how can it last yeah. <laughs> so this pure horizontal uh, reinforced earth slab keep going Broby okay so as uh, Dr. Oliver made mention of the material that we have, we have the polymer type, which is the geo grade. We also have the steel type. So with the polymer, the geo grade, we have geo grade also in strips, and then we have the we have the polymer in strips and also in grade. Then with the steel, we can also have the steel in strips and also in grade. So if you look at the pictures that we have here, this one, the first one is the, the polymer in the grid. And then the next to the, yes, this one here is the metallic one in the grid, but we also have the metallic one in the strips, in a strip form, which is usually connected to the panels and then used for the construction. Yes, this one to uh, talk about it briefly. So in areas where we can apply the geosynthetics in the slope uh, stabilization and for landslide mitigation, if our slope is not stable, or we see that there's an area where there, there's a possibility of sliding, then we can uh, build the reinforced F there serving as a gravity uh, wall to prevent uh, failure. Then in terms of embankment for our road construction, usually to um, extend the, the, the length of road, like the example that uh, Dr. Oliver gave, where the place is not stable. And if you have to get additional length of road, you need to uh, apply this principle. Then also in retaining walls, in retaining walls, we, we can apply uh, the reinforced earth system. Bridge abutment, as what uh, 
Dr. George has also given to us. So these are some of the applications or in areas where we can apply uh, the reinforced earth system. Okay, so what are the design considerations? If somebody might think, oh, this thing, how is it going to work? Is it going to be okay? Is it going to be stable? But when we follow the engineering principle, we can make it uh, stable and we will not have any problem. So we look at the design load, the design load, what are the life load, what are the dead loads, or if you are going to have seismic load. Mostly in Africa, we are seismic or earthquake is not much of a problem to us, but there are some areas also in Africa which experience some form of uh, earthquake. So we also do consider earthquake loading in the design. We look at the design life of the structure, which is also very key, how long the structure is going to be in operation. From what Dr. George has given us, we've seen an abutment which has been in operation for over 30 years. So considering a, a structure which is going to be a permanent structure, 30 years, 50 years design life, each design is permanently going to be different from a temporary structure, which is going to be there for just a few uh, years or few months. Okay, then we have to also look at the foundation. The foundation of the, or the properties of the substructure. So we go through the normal geotechnical investigation that we do for any other structure. Assuming if we're going to put up a, real, uh, a reinforced concrete structure, we will go there with our equipment, do our test, get the properties of the material, the bearing capacity, the settlement uh, parameters, groundwater conditions, properties of the, the chemical properties also of the soil down there, we need to get to know because the material that we are going to use, either is a polymeric material or the, uh, the metallic material, there is going to be a reaction uh, between this material and the soil that is down there. So we have to also uh, get to understand the chemical properties of the soil down there. Then also, we need to look at the physical and chemical properties of the soil that we are going to use for the as a fuel, the fuel material. We have to also uh, get to understand the properties. So the physical properties, which is the, the grading of the material, the gradation, we have to also look at the the atabeck limit of the material and other uh, chemical properties like the chloride, the sulfur, the pH of the soil so that we know how they are going to interact with the uh, reinforcement. Okay, then the material also need to be tested to ascertain its strength. Because we've, uh, if we pick the, the, grid, the geo grid for instance, we have different uh, tensile strength depending on the magnitude of the project or how high the, the, the structure is going to be or the kind of load that is going to be on this uh, structure, we choose a particular uh, strength. So we have to assess the, the, the strength of the reinforcement. Then what is the elongation? If the, uh, there's a load being applied on this material, how is it going to Robbie, expand? Robbie, watch the time. Try to go a bit uh, faster. We're uh, excited okay. to see the okay. case study. <laughs> All right. So then we look at the tensor, the elongation, corrosion, uh, pull-out capacity, or uh, all these to, uh, are to be tested for the reinforced material. Then we have to also look at uh, pore pressures. Uh, for the pictures that we've seen here, there are some uh, pipes in there to drain water to reduce the amount of uh, pore pressure that will be developed in the field. Okay, so we also look at the stability consideration. The stability consideration is similar to the conventional retaining wall. So we have to 
uh, check the internal stability and then the external stability. So in terms of the external stability, we look at the, the sliding, uh, uh, overturning, uh, we look at settlement failure, bearing capacity failure. Then in terms of the internal stability, which deals with the, uh, the stability of the reinforced block, which contains the reinforced material. So we look at the pull out capacity of the reinforced material. We, are, we look at the tensile strength, uh, yes, of the, of the reinforced material. Then I we like have to, to also- uh... I like to add here global stability also, especially if you are on a slope. Yes. So you have sliding, yeah. overturning, bearing, and settlement, but also global should not. Uh, global stability. It's rare to have such a problem, but it exists. I had a couple of times uh, problems like this, especially if you have water on the ground that's pressurized. Keep going, Robbie. Okay. Then one other thing we need to consider is the stability of the facing. Because most of these material, the structures have different, different facings. So facings must also be stable uh, against failure. Okay, so uh, I will look at the failure here. We have, yes, if you look at this, for instance, there is a rupture, a rupture of the material, of the, of the grade or the metal. So we need to consider the rupture. We have to also consider pull out here, and then we look at the stability of the facing. Okay. So in Africa, what are the challenges that we have and what's, what are the way forward? One problem that we have is the acceptability of the usage of the reinforced earth system. So we did some study on the use of uh, the reinforced earth system in Ghana, like structures, the various structures in which uh, the reinforced earth has been used and it didn't come out well. Uh, just some few structures have been, uh, the, the, the reinforced it has been used in just some few structures. Okay, then we went further and then researched why this uh, low petridage. And then we also got to know that one of the major reason is lack of uh, knowledge of its usage. You can meet a seasoned engineer, somebody who has been in the engineering industry for over 20 years, 30 years, but the person has little or no knowledge about the, uh, the reinforced That's system. That's why we have this IITT. Yes. So that, that is one uh, other problem that we saw as the cause of the low patronage and also sometimes availability of the of the materials in the market. But I, but I have some good news for you. That is not only in Africa, it also happens in the US. So the lack of well, knowledge. So don't okay. don't so that's a silver lining for that. Okay. Also oh. also in Europe. Okay. All right. So uh we got to know that at least if we can incorporate in the uh, in the academia some uh, way to introduce geosynthetics into our curricula. For instance, at the university level, at the polytechnic level, there should be a course that at least the, if you have the just or even just introduction, the various geosynthetics and how they are being applied. Uh, some, these are some of the projects, like what we are doing. It will uh, at least give a first hand uh, idea or information to these students. So when they come out, they will have uh, uh, some knowledge about the geosynthetics. 
Because for me, for instance, at the undergrad level, I didn't have any knowledge, uh, any understanding of uh, geosynthetics. It was during the master's uh, study that I got um, to do some courses uh, on geosynthetics. Are so there, is it in the uh, curricula in the US? In the undergrad level? Very limited. Undergrad level, no. I'm but asking they, in the US, how about uh, Germany, Oliver? Do they, we probably just mention it, but we don't do any design of slope stabilization or retaining wall using geosynthetic. Right. Yeah, it's, it's it's normally not very really included. So it's it's on us, the society, to go there and give the lectures and the presentations. Only a few universities do it now, but it could be much more. It should be much more. It should. There be, is yes. an important initiative. There is an important initiative by the International Geosynthetic Society that is called Educate the Educators. So if the country or the local the the, the local society is interested in having a course for professors, because in many cases it's the professors not that they do not recognize the importance, but they do not have the tools or they do not have the experience to teach it. This is a, a good initiative that will provide such tools. Uh, so I urge you to consider that initiative uh, if, if there is interest. In this case in Ghana, it could be a good target to Sure. For, for a program. Mm -hmm. So I think what what uh, Dr. George is saying is just as my, my uh, last slide here, uh, we have to find a way to educate and then train those who are already on the job, the engineers on the job, the professors who are supposed to teach so that they will also understand and then accept it using. Because some people find it difficult to accept it. Okay, so we will look at some uh, case studies that we have uh, done in Ghana. The first one, the case study one, is uh, a slope uh, protection. So there is, there is a railway line, and then there is also a road. So the railway line is on top, or is at a higher elevation, while the, the road is below. So initially, they, the contractor wanted to put up uh, reinforced concrete on this, as, on this surface at this point. But if you check from, oh, sorry, there is a drain, there is a drain that is just behind the abutment. So it was an obstacle for them to construct the reinforced concrete base. So they reached out to us and then we looked through, we did a design and we started with the construction. So we just, we prepared the surface and looking at this side to the foundation it's not or the soil there about up to about three meters deep is clay. So if you also have to put a reinforced concrete, this slope is about 7.8 meters high. If you have to put a reinforced concrete to this height, where there's about three meter deep of weak uh, soil, it was going to be a big issue. So we did a design. And then I think the spacing of the of the grade was um, I think point point five of a meter. So at each level we put the point five, we compact it, we put another layer, point five, we compact it up to the last layer. So the slope was about 40 meters, at a 40 degree, 40, about 40 degree slope. And now it is 
working perfectly. I think it was done in uh, 2019. Uh, it's, it's completely done. And then the, the railway is, is, is also functioning now. Then we have another one in, uh, in Takoradi, which is also um, an embankment or a slope protection. There is a building which is to be constructed. If you look at the, the last uh, picture here, the, the building is to be constructed here, but down the difference in elevation at the base of the building and the ground here is about 14 meters, 14 meters high. But the client wanted uh, enough parking space. The building is for the uh, Ghana uh, GNPC, Ghana National Petro uh, Petroleum Corporation. So they needed enough parking space. But looking at the 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 change in uh, level or elevation if it is not uh filled there is no way they will have that and you're going for a reinforced concrete to a height of about 14 meters we saw it to be very expensive so we did the design and that one also we uh, we constructed it but this one had a gabion facing so it was also 0.5 of a meter. So you put the grid there, you put the gabion basket, you fill it, you close the gabion basket, you fill the, you fill it with the, uh, the soil, you compact it, seal. When one layer is done, you put another layer on top, put the basket on it, fill the basket, close it, and then uh, repeat it till you get to the required level. Okay, so now the last uh, case study, which is a, a very massive uh, project that was embarked in Ghana. In, uh, we started in 2019 and it was completed in 2021, which is a, a fourth year interchange in Ghana. So all the ramps or the approaches uh, were constructed using reinforced earth system, all the ramps. So I think the highest ramp, uh, the, the one with the highest height was about uh, 14 meters high. That was for the last tier. So 14, one, one two, four. The 14, 14 yes. meters and vertical. 14 meters, vertical, 14 meters With the vertical. hard facing. How many the slides facing, do you still have? Because we're running out of time, Broby. Just one. Uh, good. Okay. So this one to the facing was a uh, uh, precast uh, concrete that was arranged as a facing to protect the, the grid. Okay. So at the end, this is how it, it looked. This, this was... This is how it looks. So you have, if you see here, you can see the, the panels that have been arranged in, in, in that way. Okay, so that is that is all for, for what we have in, in Africa. This is in Ghana. Yes, this is in Ghana. Where, which city? In the capital? In Accra. Accra yes. capital. Very, very nice. Thank you guys so much. I have to conclude, we ran out of time, but it's a beautiful and interesting topic. Oliver, thank you for explaining about the technical committee and its activities, very active technical committee. I have to mention that ISSNG has about 40 technical committees and this covers the TC218. So I'm, uh, we're trying to cover with the IITT talks all uh, technical committees is going to be difficult before my uh, leaving uh, the presidency. Uh, also, thank you for the case study that you mentioned uh, with the creeping plastic deformation of the two slopes, north and south, uh, and the solution using uh, 
Earth Reinforcement and Geosynthetics, Jorge, the beautiful animated six cases for uh, GR, you say GR-LC and then you say LC-GR. Which one should we adopt? <laughs> LC-GR. LC-GR. Low carrying geosynthetic geosynthetic reinforce. Ground reinforcement for the abutment of Bridget. And Correct. basically, what I like to say to all the engineers, geotechnical engineers, that you should think strain compatibility in design, not just load carrying and load bearing capacity. Because what we should avoid is differential settlement, not deformation. And Robbie, thank you uh, finally for mentioning the basics for the young engineers. It was very important. And uh, for people uh, who are new to the topic, your explanation was very good. And for the cases in uh, Ghana, uh, which uh, complements uh, the previous cases in Europe and around the world. So with this, I'd like to conclude, unless you have something to say. Thank you for the initiative. Thank you for the opportunity. We are very, uh, this is very excellent. Robbie, if you stop sharing, Okay. This way our faces will be better on the video. <laughs> so if you have any conclusions, uh, feel free to mention before we conclude. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, there are many important new technologies. We should embrace them. Yes. And uh, hope to see you in person very soon. Ciao, ciao. Yeah. Ciao, ciao.